If you turn your Bibles to Psalm 33, Psalm 33. And I'm going to just uh, read the first part of verse 12 and get going. And there's a reason why that I'm not reading the latter part of it. And I'm not yet reading all the verses that precede that verse or the verses that come after it, but we will. But I just want to do it in a certain way so that we understand uh, the intention so Psalm 33:12, we, we can go Psalm 33:12a. I should have put a, and America, who is the real people of God. Now I was raised by a pastor, and I was raised in West Virginia in a certain Christian culture, and so I still remember it going down, a sermon like this: "Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord." Now watch what I'm doing. And then for about 40 minutes, we would get what Carl Truman, published in 2010, uh, says in this book. Uh, it's called Republicrat. And then it's got a morphing of a, of a donkey and, a, and an elephant picture right here. Great book. And this book is about this page 32 another area where a secular mentality impacts the church is the identif identification of the nation of america with god's special people and this whole chapter is is about that it's called the slipperiness of secularization that's happening in the church and he wrote this and published this in 2010 highly recommend this book um, no matter where you fall, he'll get you. <laughs> uh, he will back you in the corner and, 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 and Carl Truman style. Um, uh, his subtitle of this book is called Confessions of a Liberal Conservative. He's, he's just, he's just uh, very, very good book. I did, and many of us in here, I grew up in a culture, a Christian culture that synchronized uh, my American citizenship uh, with my Christianity, so much so that if you were a, a good conservative American that went to church on Sunday, you were considered a Christian, period. We understand how that can happen, given the fact that for, for years and years and years and years, presidents, and, and I love American history, but presidents have quoted scripture, uh, Congress has quoted scripture, and used verses like Psalm 33, 12, invoked that front part of that verse, and then blended it with Christianity and the Bible, and, or American citizenship. Yes, uh, this country, uh, you cannot deny that it does have what Francis Schaeffer calls a Christian consensus heritage, and that is true but not necessarily Christian in the biblical sense. And here's what I mean. You can't say you're a Christian while you are rejecting the person and work of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You can't. And this country has a long, long history of claiming I'm a Christian because I believe in God and I'm an American citizen, while rejecting Jesus. No, you cannot be a Christian if you reject his son whom he sent. So my aim this morning is to help us uh, to know the real people of God so that we can know if we are the blessed people. It says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We'll come back to that. And then what does that mean in terms of application for our lives? Well, we've been observing uh, that our culture str struggles with definitions. Struggles with definitions. Um, think with me, and you can think out loud and say it. Um, many of us in here uh, can still recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, and we still remember, uh, I do, uh, remember all through grade school, uh, 
that was the first thing that was done at, in class. And there was a flag in class at proper tilting uh, um, by Congress. You have to has to be angled at a proper angle, and we all turn hands on the heart and and said the pledge of allegiance to the flag. And but it, but just like anything, you know how you can just get so used to words that you're you're not really thinking about them, and you haven't thought about them in a long time. But think about the context of the, of the, of the synchronization of Christianity and liberal, liberal, liberal Christianity all throughout the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Every mainline denomination in this country rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior while still meeting on Sunday and saying they're Christian. And many of my teachers in grade school were just like that. These words that's found in the Pledge of Allegiance, the word one, in that line, one nation under God, indivisible, one. What Define, define one. Singular, unity. Define nation. One nation. Borders. borders. Oh, you said borders. Borders. Group of people. Yeah. Identity. Identity. Mm hmm Structure. Government. Yeah. Americans. Americans as a whole. Under, the word under, one nation under. Now we know what this subject is, is God, so you have to, you have to think about it. Under. Subordinate, subordinate beneath, submission, service. service. But under God. So and I, I've, I heard this when I was a little boy, that America is God's most favorite nation. In other words, the blessings. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and there is no country like America. So we are certainly, we are under, we are under God's blessing. What about Germany? Oh, they're not under God's blessing. They're under God's curse. And every nation in the world is under God's curse, except America. Um, here's an interesting word, God. But think in terms of the cultural mindset in America, especially the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and even to this day, and how I grew up, who is this God? Define him. Yeah, pleasure. Yeah. Health. No, well, huh? Yourself. Yourself? Yeah, can be. Yeah. When you read American history and you read what Thomas Jefferson said, what Thomas Paine said, P A Y N E. Oh, P-A-I-N. Yeah, this is wrong one. Whoop, wrong one. More than half of those signatures on that Constitution were written by men who were what was called deists. They believed in God, but this God is impersonal. He did not send his son. I've, I've walked up to people. I still enjoy doing it. And just ask them, um, I heard you use the word God, so who is he? Define him. Define him. You'd be surprised that people do not mean the God of the scriptures who sent his son. I've said this before. Pull out a dollar bill or a coin, and it says, in God we trust, right there. I said, would it bother you if we, if we took the word God out and put Jesus Christ on our currency? Oh, that's, we can't have that. And see, there you have it. See, 
most people around us still to this day believe in God, but it's not the God who sent his son. Indivisible. So let's raise the question. What is it that cements, so with this mindset, what is it that cements this nation together? Indivisible. What is it that cements this nation together? That's what indivisible means. What is it that, that creates the, the, the bond? Uh, even now. With this mindset. Freedom, love of country. Yep, absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Yep, which is <laughs> that's right. Heritage, absolutely. Well, that phrase "in God we trust." On July thirtieth, nineteen fifty-six, two years after pushing to have the phrase "under God" inserted into the Pledge of Allegiance, it always it wasn't always there. President Eisenhower signs a law officially declaring in God we trust to be the nation's official motto, 1956. And the following year, 1957, was the first time that paper money had in God we trust put on it. On this date, President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed into law H.R. 619, a bill that required that the inscription in God we trust appear on all paper and coin currency. Representative Charles E. Bennett of Florida introduced the resolution in the House where it won fast backing from the Committee on Banking and Currency and support from like-minded members such as Herman Eberharter of Pennsylvania and Orrin Harris of Arkansas. Quote from Representative Bennett of Florida, Nothing can be more certain than that our country was founded on a spiritual atmosphere and with a firm trust in God. While the sentiment of trust in God is universal and timeless, these particular four words, in God we trust, are indigenous to our country. In these days, the Cold War... In these days, when imperialistic and materialistic communism seeks to attack and destroy freedom, we should continually look for ways to strengthen the foundations of our freedom. In God We Trust will serve as a constant reminder that the nation's political and economic fortunes are tied to its spiritual faith. Now, let me say something. I am not against, I am not against casting votes to get conservative values on the books in Washington, D.C. and implemented and enforced by law. I'm not. You know why? Because I love my neighbor. And I think stealing lawnmowers ought to be punished. See, I, I believe in laws because the Bible believes in laws for the welfare of society and humanity. So I'm not against that. But when I think about, and my conversations with American citizens on this subject, what kind of God do most Americans say we are under? And most Americans will use the language of a domesticated God made in their image, not the God of the Bible, not the God who sent his son to rescue us from our sins. And when you ask the question, are other nations under this God? And I can take you to churches in West Virginia they will emphatically say, no. America is God's nation to this day. Here's a good question. Does freedom of religion include the freedom to not worship God? Does freedom of religion include the freedom to not worship God? And the answer is yes, in a democracy. Yeah. But what does the first commandment say in Exodus 20? You shall worship the Lord your God and have no other gods before me. You see, God doesn't like it when people don't worship him and they worship other gods. But it does work in a democracy. Let me say something about that. Um, when you read sections of Calvin's Institutes and the success that he had, in France uh, in the 16th century of implementing in Geneva uh, 
a, a, a democracy much like we have here in America, and the reason why we have this in America is because many, if not most of the founding fathers uh, read Calvin's Institutes and learned how to put together a more perfect union. They did. They were influenced by John Calvin. And what, did, what was it that, that was influencing John Calvin to, to work on a democracy the kind that we have today? And here are the, here are the verses that are strung together. So listen to this, and uh, you'll understand how we even came to have this kind of country. Remember when Jesus said, let the weeds and the wheat grow together? Let them grow together. F freedom of religion. Freedom of religion is because of these, these verses that I'm just going to quote to you. Let the wheat and the weeds grow together. In other words, you cannot make your religion the state religion and then go punish and imprison those who don't want to worship that way which is why the Puritans did come to this country and made this land. Remember when uh, the Apostle Peter pulled out his dagger and was ready to fight and implement and inaugurate the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, that's not how this happens. Remember Romans 13, that government is not to be used to impose a religion upon its citizens, but to do one thing and one thing primarily, and that is to punish evil behavior in a society. Romans 13. That's its function. When it gets outside of that biblical function, it usually ends up in trouble. Our form, our present form of government so far <laughs> gives freedom to abstain from worshiping the true God and the freedom to worship any God. In a fallen world, this would seem to be the best form of government. One that neither prescribes nor prohibits any form of religion. So with regard to Psalm 33, how am I supposed to read this psalm? As a Christian who happens to live in America, and let me give you the answer, and then we're going to work on Psalm 33 a little bit. Here's the answer. You are to read Psalm 33, verse 12, the same way an Indonesian Christian would read it. A German Christian would read it. A Calcutta Christian, an Iranian Christian, a Scottish Christian, a Japanese Christian, a Brazilian Christian. You are to read Psalm 33, 12, the way any Christian from any people group would read it. <clears throat> Let me show you. Psalm 33, verse 1. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you, what? Righteous. If you're unfamiliar, I preach and teach out of the, my public preaching and teaching is out of the ESV. O you, Shout for joy in the Lord, O oh, you Americans. No. You righteous. Praise befits thee upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Why? Because there's always new reasons to praise the Lord. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. So it's worship. It's corporate worship. Of who? The saints. The righteous. For the word of the Lord is upright. And all his work is done in faithfulness. Notice that the psalmist is using. And in your English translation. He's using Yahweh. Translated or with all caps. L-O-R-D, which means a covenant relationship. Not a distant relationship, but a covenant relationship. Verse 5, he loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. And we're going to find out why is the earth full of the steadfast love of the Lord. And that is because the righteous are over all the earth. His people. Out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. 
And by the word of the Lord, verse 6, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. He created the whole earth. Look at the, look at the big, big, big picture of what Psalm 33 is doing. It's not an isolated text for just one people group, for just one section of the earth. Let all the earth fear the Lord. And let that even be a prayer that one day, yes, let all the earth fear, trust, hope in the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Notice the psalmist is not allowing the congregation of Israel to be isolated in their thinking. They are, even Israel, when they sing this, are to understand that it's not just us Jews. And if it's, if it's clearly not to be meant for just Jews to think about their heritage as Israelites, as God's chosen people, how much more should Americans stop going to church on Sunday morning and thinking that we are God's most favored nation? It's just nonsense. In fact, it's idolatry. There's more idolatry taking place in churches today in America than in any other Sunday during the year. I know so, because I come from it. <laughs> For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm, verse 9. Well, what kind of a Lord do we worship? The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. Do you realize all God has to do to America? You're done. Just like that. Just like that. Acts 17, when Paul is preaching, that's what God does, just like that. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. Is this good news or bad news to you? Yeah. Because what's he going? What is his counsel? Notice. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's personal language, covenant language. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The righteous in verse 1. The upright in verse 1. Let all the earth fear the Lord. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Meaning that not even the Israelite, the Jew that would sing this on Sabbath Saturday could look at this verse and sing it and think that the word people, the people, nation, is exclusively for Israel alone. You can't do that. It has a context. And you cannot become the people of his heritage by saying... I will become his people. No, he chooses. This is the doctrine of election here. God didn't have to choose Israel. Deuteronomy ch chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Why do you love us? Because why did you choose us? Uh, I can choose anybody I want to. Or not. Because <laughs> no one deserves to be loved with steadfast love. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. Again, the Jew had no right to think of him or herself alone. This is not a text of Israelites. This is a text that exalts God over all the earth. His people are over all the earth. 
The Lord looks down from the heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. In the context, in the near context, I take verse the latter part of verse 12. The people whom he has chosen as his heritage and the reason why I love Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior is because he fashioned my heart. That's election. He fashioned my heart to love him. And that is the only way. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. You see? Here would have been a great spot for the Holy Spirit to lead the psalmist and say, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on Israel. But no. What did the Spirit lead the psalmist to write? On those who fear him over all the earth. On those who hope in his steadfast love. Are you hoping in the Lord's steadfast love for your salvation? Yes or no? Then you are the people of his heritage. You see? That he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. And every single one of those pronouns, those plural pronouns, cannot be isolated to the Israelite, to the Jew. Not in this text. It is for those who fear the Lord over all the earth. So, Psalm 33, 12a has nothing to do with Americans. But the people who love Jesus Christ whom he sent. So, let's close like this. What dangers are there when the church in America synchronizes the gospel with American heritage? I love my American heritage. I'm not throwing cold water on it. I am so glad to be living in America, to be born here. I'd rather live here than anywhere else. But there's a danger when those two get treated as synonymous. One, we unwisely blend the identity and cause mission language of the church with our country's identity and cause. Let me ask you two questions. Is an American citizen necessarily a lover of Jesus Christ? Here's the next question. Good. Next question. Is a lover of Jesus Christ necessarily an American? All right. There you go. You just preached your own sermon. You did it. You did it. That's the nail in the coffin. Subject over. Just like that. Secondly, we lose our ability to distinguish what is truly biblical from what is part of our political and cultural heritage. To, to the point where this book is no different from our cultural heritage. And, they, and they're the same, but, but they're not. Thirdly, I feel that we are more afraid of losing our creature comforts like Schaefer would say, personal peace and prosperity, than losing our effectiveness as salt and light. As Becky's grandson mentioned earlier, praying for those who are lost in sin. And fourthly, we lose the opportunity to prepare the church in America for persecution. I pray for the churches in the major cities. We need to pray for the churches. 
And the reason why is because many professing Christians are better Americans than they are Christians. I've mentioned this book before and used it from Irwin Lutzer, former pastor of Moody Church in Chicago, little paperback book, What the Cross Can Do, What Politics Can't. His three main points in his book that he spends time on are these three. Spiritual redemption through Jesus Christ, not political reformation, is at the heart of God's agenda. Though he is highly desirous to be involved in terms of voting and encouraging good citizenship in politics, like the book of Daniel. Secondly, God's agenda includes all nations, not just one special nation. And thirdly, the church, not a political party, is the bearer of God's message. And that is true. This is a famous quote from C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this one. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither found in mere Christianity. So I'd like for us to end our time today in this sermon in prayer. Would you read out loud with me this prayer that's at the end of the sermon outline? Our Heavenly Father, give us affections for you, for your holiness and for your grace in our lives. Help us not to not obscure the gospel message with our cultural heritage, with the false gospel of morality, or with man-centered religion. In the face of abounding evil, give us grace to be courageous, to be peacemakers, to submit to the ordained governing authorities, to give vengeance over to God, to love our neighbor and do him no harm, to be patient for justice, to sacrificially give out of our wealth, to be ready to suffer for doing good, and to not fear the rejection of others. We pray for a revived church in America for the sake of our fellow man. Calls Christians in our country to put you first in their lives and give them a hunger for holiness over the quest for novelty and instant gratification. Move our churches to return to your word, to have genuine brokenness over the state of the church in America, and to be willing to be identified with the cross of Christ rather than the latest wave of correctness. Our Father in heaven, we pray for our country, the one that you have placed us in, that you would give us a peaceful life to tend to our own business, to give us neither poverty nor riches, to render appropriate honor to all who represent our government, that you would keep our government under restraint for excessive evil, and that by your grace you would hold back the sinful urges and passions of godless men and women who affect our nation's course. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would open the floodgates of heaven and pour out your mercy upon the nations, not the kind of limited mercy and common grace that leaves men and women still loving their sin, but the kind of rock-shattering grace that breaks the hardened hearts of sinners to see you as the only Lord and Savior of the world. And may you give your people the strength and courage to follow Christ until he returns. Amen.